Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. But we're on, we're starting on page 72, and the chat top, the title of the chapter is Into Action, not into thinking, into action, because everything we've done up until now has been other than, in other words, steps one and two were conclusions of the mind. We read the doctor's opinion and the first four chapters, and we came to certain conclusions, steps one and two. So once we've done that, in the third step, we make a decision to do something. So again, that's thinking. So it's conclusion, conclusion, thinking, and step four is writing. So this is where we begin to put some of this stuff into action. We get beyond ourselves. And uh, the, the, the chapter begins with Bill saying, having made our pre- personal inventory, and all through this book, this is a 12-step call in, uh, in print, meaning this is the, the way to go through the steps. That's the whole purpose of this book was to go out to places uh, far away from New York where it was written. People read it, identify with it, do what these people said they did, get the results they got, and then take it to give it away to somebody else. But in the beginning, we didn't have meetings. We had this. So Bill wrote this book on the basis of, I'm telling you what we did. You do this work, and then I'll tell you what to do next. So each page is built on the previous page. So if we've arrived at page 72, It's an assumption that we have completed the first four steps. We've just finished our fourth step. Now we're moving on from there. So we said we've made our personal inventory, step four. What do we do about it? And I've highlighted this next sentence because I find it really interesting. He says, we've been trying to get a new attitude and a new relationship with our creator and discover the obstacles in our path. Well, if I work backwards, the obstacles in our path refer to those things in our inventory in that final column. If you do a four-column inventory, it's column four. If you do the five-column inventory, the later Joe and Charlie uh, stuff, it's column five. But in that last column where we we bring out the defects that underlie the angers and so on, that's what we're talking about. The obstacles in our past, our angers, our fears, our Sex conduct and harms other than sexual. That's what we're referring to here. But let me go back to the sentence because he says a couple of things here that I don't know. I, I, I want to know what is he talking about? He uses terms that I don't, I'm not quite clear on. And what I'm referring to is let's start at the beginning where he says, trying to get a new attitude. Hmm. What does that mean? A new relationship. What does that mean? Well, one of the handouts, and again, if you want copies of this stuff, just send a request to my email address and I'll send them to you. But for now, I'm going to put them up and we'll just read through it. Um, If I could find it here. Can everyone see that? Okay. Thoughts on a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator. Going back to chapter two, we are directed to read the spiritual experience appendix. In that appendix, we're told that a spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, was a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. They mean the same thing. It's just a matter of time. Experience happens quickly. Awakening happens gradually. But either one is a personality change sufficient to recover from this hopeless state of mind, body, and spirit. And we defined personality as the way we think and feel, our attitude and outlook upon life. So a spiritual attitude brings about a new way of viewing life, people. In other words, a spiritual attitude brings about, the spiritual experience brings about a new attitude. So what is the new attitude? How does it manifest itself? Well, hopefully by this time, we've begun to see that others are sick in self too. That if we can do that, if we could see that the people who harmed us are sick in self and they're acting out, then we don't feel under constant attack. These people who hurt us are not doing something to us. They're just doing it. 
and it becomes less personal. They're just acting out, not attacking me. And I begin to see that my problems aren't coming at me. They're coming from me. Coming from me, not from the people I'm angry at or afraid of. You know, I believe we're on this planet to grow in understanding and communion with our creator. And that being said, we're just a little, for some people are a little further along in that journey than others. So we can begin to look upon those who hurt us as not being where we are spiritually. And if we could do that, maybe we could start to view them with compassion and patience rather than resentment. Remember, Bill said, doesn't promise us we're going to like these people. He just says we will take a God will show us how to take a kind and tolerant view towards all. Now, if we've completed this inventory, the fourth step inventory, <clears throat> excuse me, we've begun the process of developing this new relationship. How does that manifest itself? How does this new relationship take shape? Well, if we look at the examples in our inventory process, before we learn to take, before we make our lists, Bill tells us a little prayer to use before we start looking at the angers, before we start looking at the fears. So in dealing with angers, he says to view those, we, I'm sorry, the goal he wants us to have, the goal, the new attitude, is in dealing with angers, we hope to view those who harm us as spiritually ill. In dealing with fears, we are trying to see that the reason, the goal is that the reason for our fears is we believe in ourselves, our finite selves, rather than our infinite creator. And in dealing with sex, we realize that our selfishness is the cause of our problems. But how do we begin that process of developing this new attitude? How do we begin to view people who harmed us as spiritually ill? He gives us a prayer. And that's what I was referring to a moment ago. In dealing with anger, he says, we pray to be released from the control that anger has over us by saying the following words. This is the prayer that Bill gives us. We ask God to help show them, to show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience we would cheerfully grant the sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God saved me from being angry. I'm not getting angry. I'm going to get angry. But being angry is a state of mind. I was in it 24 and 7 for years. So the prayer is, God help me from being angry. Thy will be done. And when it comes to our fears, when we encounter fear, he gave us a prayer to deal with that fear. The new attitude towards fear is I don't have to go through this alone. I ask God to remove my fear and direct our, my, our attention to what he would have us be. And what he would have us be in every circumstance is the same. No matter what I'm afraid of, what God would have me be is courageous. And once I start to recognize that, we commence to outgrow fear. We don't outgrow it. We're not past it. We begin the process. Commence to outgrow fear infers a process. We fine tune it a little bit better by the time we get to our seventh step. Because remember, the fourth step is just an inventory, really. So we identified it in the fourth step, and we start the process of overcoming the fears right away. By any time we experience fear, we ask God to remove that fear and give us the strength to be courageous, and then we can walk through it. I'm not walking through it alone. And he says to deal with our sex problems, he gave us another prayer. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them and to show us what to do when we're com confronted with the dilemma. He says, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. These practical prayers will produce a new attitude. These practical prayers, by using them, are the beginning of a new relationship with our creator. I don't know about anyone else, but for 24 years in recovery, I had a very dysfunctional relationship with my creator. You see, I began every day. By turning my will over, I said, God, I'm turning my will over to you. And this is what I want you to do today. I gave him a shopping list. And like God was my errand boy. And that's not the case at all. I am here to do his will, not him to do mine. And at the end of the day, I took out my list and I said, God, you know, you really haven't done very much on this list, but I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'll give you another shot at it. We'll try it again tomorrow. And tomorrow, the same thing over and over again. And nothing changed 
because I didn't realize that I have to do his bidding, not him do mine. And this helped me begin that process of whenever I'm angry, afraid, etc., I bring God into the picture. And my sponsor taught me that anytime I invite God into anything in my life, the dynamics immediately change. I may not see it, but they do. I'm no longer doing it alone. And that's a new attitude for me and a new relationship with my creator. So maybe that'll explain that phrase a little better because it threw me for a long time. But we are trying to get this new attitude and a new relationship. So back to the book. He says, we have admitted certain defects. Again, those, that final column in our inventory, I'm frightened, irresponsible, inconsiderate, dishonest, selfish, self-seeking, judgmental. See, when I began my fourth step inventory, I thought it was all about the first column, the people I'm angry at, afraid of, etc. It's not. It's all about the final column, those defects that came out. And we're about to talk about that. He said, we have ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We've put our finger on the weak items in our inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. And that's what I was referring to. In the fourth step, we identify those things that block us from God. Frightened, irresponsible, inconsiderate, and so on. In step five, we're going to share them with somebody else. In step six, we're going to become willing to turn them loose. And in step seven, we ask God to take them away and to convert them into assets. It's a process that we start by identifying them in the fourth step. He says, this requires action on our part. And incidentally, in our workshops, we highlight any reference to must. Anytime Bill puts a must in this book, because there are people who say there are no musts in AA. There's a, a ton of them in this book. So what we do is we highlight them each time to draw attention to it. And this is another must. The word require is just a fancy way of saying must. This requires action on our part, which when completed will mean we have admitted to God, to ourselves and another human being, the exact nature of our defects. Catch what he did there? What does the step say? The step says that we admitted uh, our, our nature, I'm sorry, that uh, we admitted to God, to ourselves and other human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. In step five wording, he uses the word wrong. In step six, he uses the word defect. In step seven, he uses the word shortcoming. And I've gone to plenty of meetings where I've heard people bloviate about the difference between a wrong, a defect, and a shortcoming. And when Bill was asked, he said they mean the same thing. I learned in college that it's a sign of, of ignorance when you start using the words over and over, same words over and over again. You know what I mean? 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 So he's trying to find different words. And he said, that's what I did. And here's a great example, a great proof of that, because the step it says, na says nature of our wrongs. The narrative here says nature of our defects. If that doesn't in, in point out that they mean the same thing, I don't know what does. And he does it a few more times in this, and he does it an awful lot more in the 12 and 12. He interchanges these words because they mean the same thing. So he said, uh, and, and incidentally, he said, we've admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being. One of the things we do in this fifth step is we begin to tie up the three basic dimensions of life. I know there's a school of thought that says there are only two, but there are three. And I'd be glad to have that discussion with anybody at any time, just not now, because that's not uh, what we're talking about. But there are three basic dimensions of life, and Bill refers to them all through the book, the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. And the fifth step, we start to tie all of those things together. We get right by admit, admitting things to God. We get right in the spiritual dimension. By sitting down and figuring them out ourselves on paper, we get right with ourselves in the mental dimension. And by sharing them with somebody else, we get right in the physical dimension, which is the world and everyone in it. So for the first time in the steps, we begin to get out of just ourselves. We're beginning to tie up all the other ends. Because by the time we're done with this, in the first three steps, we will have gotten right with God. We make peace and we're in harmony spiritually. In step four, five, six, and seven, we get right. We get in harmony. 
mentally. And in eight and nine, we get right. We get in harmony physically. So by the time we're halfway through with the ninth step, those things on page 83 describe our life. Those aren't promises anymore. Those are observations of what life is like having gone through the nine steps. Page 52 tells us what it's like beforehand. And page 83 tells us what it's like afterwards. They're observations, not promises. But we begin that process of tying these three dimensions up right here in the fifth step. So he says, this brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. Again, didn't say wrongs, defects. Um, we think we've done well enough in, main, in admitting these things to ourselves. These things are those defects. There is doubt about that. How's that? You know, I thought I did a pretty good job with my inventory. And here Bill is saying, hmm, maybe not. Maybe you didn't do as good a job here as you thought you did. And that really threw me. But he explains it just like any other, any other great teacher. He doesn't make a statement without backing it up. So he says that we, we've done well enough in admitting these things. There is doubt in actual practice. And it, I've highlighted this. We usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Insufficient. Why? Well, there in, 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 in you, me and talking to you, there's nothing between us but air. It's very easy for me to see defects your character defects, because there's nothing between us. It's very difficult for me to honestly see my defects because of years and years and years of rationalizing and justifying my behavior. So there's a lot of baggage between me and the truth. So a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient because I've got all of this clutter of rationalization and justification in a way between me and the truth but there's not that barrier between me and you. So this self-appraisal needs somebody outside of myself to see the things in me that I don't or won't see. Because there's nothing between us but air. You could see me much easier than I could see me. And that's what he means by that. Uh, Since many of us thought it necessary to go much further, we'll be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do it. The best reason first, and I've highlighted this next sentence. Here's the best reason why we do it this way. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Vital means life supporting. Um, one of my lungs is not a vital organ. I got two of them. One of my kidneys, not a vital organ. I got two of them. My heart, that's a vital organ because I've only got one of those. I've spent most of my life acting as if my brain weren't a vital organ because I didn't use it very often. But technically, my brain is a vital organ. Theoretically, I can't live without it, even though my track record indicates I did. But technically, I can't. So I need that vital organ. So he said, if we skip that vital step, that life-giving step, we may not overcome drinking. And then he goes into something else. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. I say he goes on to something else because he made a statement. He said, the best reason first, right? We just read that. Here's the best reason. If you skip it, you're going to go back to drinking. He doesn't give a second or a third, or a fourth reason. Anyone ever noticed that? Now, I don't know about anyone else, but if that's the number one reason, I don't need a second or a third reason. Telling me if I don't do it, I'm going to die. I get it. Okay, I'm going to do this thing. So the best reason is really the only reason, and he doesn't give us any more. So he says, trying to avoid this humbling experience, and I thought for many years, that that said humiliating. I didn't realize there was a difference. Humiliating is embarrassment. Humbling is just recognition of one's shortcomings. I see myself as I really am. I recognize that I have faults and I don't know everything. 
So that's what this is. This is a humbling experience, not a humiliating experience. We do this to do this to recognize our shortcomings. He said they have turned to easier, rec- trying to avoid this, they turn to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Now, one of the things I suggest in the workshops is when you come across a section of the book that's particularly relevant to you personally, personalize it. In other words, change the we's to I. I know some folks who do that with the whole book. They've crossed out every word, every time we is re- referred to and write I. Mark Houston, one of my mentors, says that his whole book has the word we crossed out everywhere. And he didn't write I, he wrote the word Mark. So he knows that Bill is talking about him. If I read this and I say we, 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 I may be thinking he's talking about somebody else. And I say that because I have this section personalized because this so hits so close to home for me. It says, having persevered with the rest of the program, I wondered why I relapsed. I, and I and say, those of you who don't know me, I've celebrated 10 year anniversaries three times in recovery. <laughs> I don't know how many knuckleheads you know that can make that kind of statement, but I've celebrated 10 year anniversaries three times. And I'm coming up on my 17th year this time. I did things a little bit differently. I did it the way the book said to do it, not the way Howard thought he should do it. And I highlighted the next two sentences because it explains the way I went about things. I think the reason I never, the reason is I never completed my house cleaning. I didn't. I didn't think I needed to do a fourth step. You see, I told myself I go to meetings and share openly all the time. So I don't need a fourth step. And I don't need a fifth step because I don't need the fourth. What am I going to share in the fifth? And I didn't have anything on that list. So I don't need the sixth or the seventh. And I never heard anybody. So I don't need eight and nine. So basically, the way I worked the steps was one, two, 12. That was it. (laughs) That was the three steps process for me. Um, And in in the next sentence, again, I've highlighted this. I took inventory, all right, but I hung on to some of the worst things in in stock. I only thought I lost my egoism and fear. I only thought I humbled myself. But I had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until I told someone else all my life story. Necessary, incidentally, is highlighted. It's a must. It's a twenty-dollar version of must. And I think this is where some people get confused. You know, some folks. I can personalize it myself. I thought the fourth step is about writing out my life story. Why? Because people told me it. That's what you do. And they pointed to some stuff like this, where we tell our life story. So that means we must be writing our life story in the fourth step. But that's not the case. Where we are here on page 73 is we have completed our fourth step. And if I follow the directions in the book, that's a series of lists. I don't write out my life story. I then in my fifth step, sit down with someone and tell my life story through those lists. And if the fact that I was born in 1952 and then I had one brother and went to PS 139 for grade school, if those facts are relevant, then they'll appear in that list. If they're not relevant, They're not discussed. This isn't a biography. This is a review of the defects that have been motivating me my whole life. What has been leading to my downfall? It's not the drugs. It's not the alcohol. It's the defective thinking process. Going on, um, he's going to start to now tell us why we need to share this with another human being. He says, more than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He's much. He's very much the actor to the outer world. He presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to join a certain. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. A practicing alcoholic really lives two lives. I know I did, and I'll keep it to myself. When I was sober, I tried to live the way I thought I was supposed to live. I had a conscience. When I was sober, I actually did have a conscience. But alcohol and drugs lower your inhibition, inhibitions. And when you get a head full of chemicals that lower your inhibitions, watch out. 
because you are going to do some things you wouldn't ordinarily do. That conscience disappears. So I live two lives as an active alcoholic. The one I want you to see, which is the sober Howard, and the one I'm trying to hide, which is the things I do when I'm high and drunk. But I also lived a double life in recovery. See, I look at it beyond that. I know I made a lot of mistakes over the years. I made every mistake you can possibly make. But one of those was being more concerned that you like what I have to say, that you find what I have to say funny. That was the most important thing to me when I walked into a meeting. I've got to put my hand up at some point today and make these people laugh. That was my goal. It truly was for 20 some odd years to be the funny man, to be the comedian, to get them to laugh. And I was good at that. I was the Michael Jordan of sharing, but I didn't learn a damn thing about recovery. So I had a double life even in recovery. Um, going on to the next paragraph, he describes a spiritual malady. He says the inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he's revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These nightmares, these memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes these memories far inside himself. Again, stuff it, rationalize it, justify it. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He's under constant fear and tension. That makes for more drinking. Psychologists will, are inclined to agree with us. We've spent thousands of dollars for examinations. We know but few instances where we have given these doctors a fair break. We have seldom told them the whole truth. You know, I, I had no idea what the truth was. I knew I was lying to these guys, but I didn't know what the truth was. I had no idea. Um, unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we're honest with no one else. Anyone identify with that? Right? We're paying these people. We're giving them money to help us. And we're lying to them. <laughs> How incredibly stupid is that? I'm paying you to listen to me, and I'm telling you stories. No wonder you couldn't help me. Uh, he says, small wonder many in the medical profession have a low opinion of alcoholics and their chance for recovery. We have lied to those people who have tried to help us. And I lied to them because I thought they were interfering. I thought that's what the professionals that my dad took me to, psychologists, psychiatrists, all of those guys. I thought they were interfering with my self-will, and I hated opposition, and I staunchly resented advice, and that's what they were giving me. That's why I think this book works so well, at least for me, because it gives me this information in a very non-judgmental manner, and it leaves me free to decide whether I want to take the advice of the people who are telling us what they did, their experience, you know, even rehabs get tired of us, not just uh, uh, therapists who we lie to, rehabs get tired of us. You know, we all come into rehab, if you've ever been in detox and rehab, you know, we come in on our knees, please help me, I'll do anything, I'll just, I'll just make it go away, I just need to feel better, just tell me what to do, and two days later, it's what do you mean I can't use the phone anytime I want? What do you mean I can't smoke anytime I want? What do you mean I can't go for a walk anytime I want? We tell them everything that's wrong with the rehab and we start to run the place. No wonder why rehabs get sick of us. <laughs> we'll do anything for the first 48 hours and then we want to be a partner in the enterprise. So in any case, the bottom line, bottom line in this page is highlighted. We must be entirely honest with somebody and must is circled because it's must. We must be entirely honest with somebody. Not everybody. You don't have to go to a meeting and tell all your truth to everybody. You can keep certain secrets if you want to yourself, but you have to be open to someone. Someone, one person gets it all. No secrets to that person. And he says, we do it if we expect to live long and happily in this world. Rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose the person or persons. Anyone notice that? 20 some odd years, I didn't catch the fact that he said persons. That means I could do my fifth step with more than one person. 
So if I want to take it to a rabbi or a priest or a therapist, I could do that. But that's just confession. I'm not going to learn anything from that. I must do it with someone who's walked this path before me, who knows how to guide me through it. This is like a minefield. And if I, and, it, and my sponsor is the guy that has the map to navigate that minefield. And if I don't have him, I'm going to step on something and I'm going to blow up. So I can easily do this with more than one person if that's what I want to do. But bear in mind, it's just confession. It's just cathartic. It's just getting it off our chest. I learn when I do it with someone who's done this before, who could stop me and say, wait a minute, you think you're being inconsiderate there, but you're actually being dishonest. You say this affects your pride, but actually it's your 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 ambitions, whatever. The point is, He's walked the path before me. He knows that there's a sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh step coming down the pike. And I'm going to need this information in those steps. So he leads me into that information. Every time I do a fifth step, I am leading the sponsee into discovering certain information that we're going to use in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth step. So anyone who tells you to burn your fourth step, don't, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, it, it the, the future is on those pages. Don't burn them. You'll need it for these steps, the rest of these steps. And he says, those of us belonging to a religious denomination, which requires confession, must, again, is a must. And of course, we'll want to be to go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive. Though we may have no religious connection, we still may do well to talk with someone ordained by an established religion. Why? Because established religions are basically just spiritual programs. It's the messengers that we kind of get a little off with. At its heart, every religion is spiritual in nature. It tries to get us to live by tolerance, compassion, patience, humility, forgiveness, love, and goodwill. I don't care what the religion is. That's at the core of it. So if we're talking to a representative of that religion in his heart, that's what he's about. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, <clears throat> if we cannot or would not do this, we search your acquaintance. He, here's a, incidentally, I should have said this in the beginning. Um, bear in mind, this book was written in 1938-39 when uh, you couldn't just walk into a meeting, get a sponsor, and do this fifth step with them. You had to actually go out and find somebody. You'd may not have had a sponsor to get you to this point. A lot of people didn't in the beginning. They, the book was their sponsor. So he's saying here, he's showing you how desperate they were in those days, how important it is to do this. Look at the advice he gives us and think of how practical it would be if we applied it today. Find yourself a closed mouth, understanding friend. Can you imagine doing your fifth step with a friend? How about this? How Perhaps a doctor or psychologist we already proved we lied to those guys. We're not going to be straight with them. And here's how desperate they were. Can you imagine doing this? It may be one of our own family. <laughs> Can you imagine doing a fifth step with someone in your family? For one thing, they better be on one of those lists anyway. And you don't want to hurt them. So a family member is a bad idea, but the fact that he says to do it that way is just conveying urgency. We have to do it. We can't fall back on, well, I don't have anyone to do it with. Find someone. And be grateful for the fact that today it's very easy to find people. When this book was written, it was not. Um, he says, but we cannot disclose anything to our wives or parents which will hurt them and make them unhappy. We And I've highlighted the rest of this paragraph. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. We're not to seek relief at another's expense. I'm not supposed to gain freedom by burdening someone else. That's selfish. And I'm using these steps to free myself of the burden of self, to go from self-centered to God-centered. So I really shouldn't do anything as selfish as burdening somebody because I need to get it off my chest. That's not what it's about. He said the rule is we must 
be hard on ourselves, but not always considerate of others. That word rule, incidentally, is not used very much. It's only used nine times in the first 164 pages. So he uses it very sparingly, nine times in 164 pages. Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one is so situated that there is no suitable, no person, suitable person available. If that is so, this step may be postponed only, however, and please highlight this, if we hold ourselves in complete readiness to go through it at the first opportunity. The way I read that today is if you're all alone on this polar ice cap and you have nobody to talk to, you can put it off. But if you're all alone on the polar ice cap, the first guy who knocks on your door, he's going to get an earful. Come here, pal. I don't care what you're here to deliver. You're going to hear this because I have to do it. But guys, I don't don't speak English. Uh, too bad. I'm going to say it. Okay. In any case, um, we say this because we are very anxious that we talk to the right person. Please highlight this next sentence. It is important that he be able to hold the keep of confidence, that he fully understand and approve what we're driving at, driving at and he will not try to change our plan. If I tell somebody my inventory and they're not familiar with what we're doing here, they're going to tell me things like, oh, you're being too harsh on yourself. Don't do that. You don't need to get into that. Yeah, I do. And if you've done this work, you understand that. So I can't go to somebody who's going to try and convince me not to do what it is I need to do. Um, and he says, but we must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. When we decide who is to hear our story, Please underline this. We waste no time. Bill is constantly telling us, once we're done with one step, move on to the next. The only time he gives us a break is you're going to find after step five, he lets us rest for an hour. But it's not really resting for an hour because he gives us an assignment. He says we can sit for an hour, but take down the book and do something. We'll get to that later. Um, so, again, urgency, time. Once we pick someone, do it. Once you finish your fourth step, pick someone, do it. Move on. Uh, we have a written inventory and are prepared for a long talk. There's the story. The long talk is telling our story through the information on those pages. Uh, we can explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it. Please highlight why we have to do it, because that's a must. He says it a lot of different ways. But you can change that word, say we, we explain to our partner what we're about to do and why we must do it. It's the same thing. He shouldn't get realize we are engaged upon a life and death errand. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help and they'll be honored by our confidence. I don't know about anyone else, but when somebody asks me to sponsor them, to take them through the steps, to do a fifth step with them, I, I don't have words to describe how blessed I feel that you're trusting me basically with your with the truth, with your life. This is not something I take lightly. I don't think anybody should. A sponsorship is a sacred relationship. And if somebody asks me to do that in their life, that means something. That is up there with marriage and a child it is a, a, a relationship that i take very seriously it is a sacred relationship and here's the assignment here's where bill tells us what to do we pocket our pride and go to it illuminating every twist of character every dark cranny of the past stop that's the fifth step everything beyond this moves into the other steps and that's where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to turn it over to my guys and uh, let them share a little bit. Um, if we're going to do a little bit of a question and answer, do you want to do that after they share? Uh, Howard, it's entirely up to you. You are uh, hosting the meeting, as to say, so to say. So please feel free, however it uh, yeah, suits. Let's let, let's let it go. Let's let it go. And uh, we'll do it afterwards. So. Uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce three people 
who have agreed to come here and tell us their experience. About 15 minutes, guys, if you wouldn't mind. Go ahead. You're first, man. Hi, Hart. Uh, yeah, John I've Alcoholic. I've got a little extra time now. <laughs> yeah, it takes me about 15 minutes saying hello. <laughs> but uh, yeah, great to be here. Um, uh, thanks, Sonny and Matt, for hosting us. It's a, it's a great idea going through your book, you know, line for line and breaking stuff down, you know, hearing different groups' perspectives on it. Um, it's good to see everyone here, you know, uh, and that for me, uh, my experience with Step 5, I've been through it about a couple of times with different people. Um, you know, looking back, you know, they went through it. You're kind of going by what the other person knew. This is my experience. But it was only the last time uh, we went through it with Howard and uh, that I really got the full benefit of it because the thing was broken down properly and made to look at really specific things, you know, on my Step 4 inventory. But, um, you know, one of the things, like, I'll give a bit of background. For me, how I found Step 5 challenging was a lot to do with my upbringing and the environment I grew up in and things I experienced in the home. Um, I grew up in a family that was, it was kind of violent that it was like the secrets were kept in the house. You weren't allowed to share anything that went on in the house outside the house. So you were like preconditioned, as it were, you know, to, what goes on in the house stays in the house. So you've been conditioned to keep secrets from a young age, you know, and, uh, and from a young age, I felt as though I couldn't talk to the people closest to me about things that were going on in my life and how things were affecting me. So I, I was very much a person that kept stuff to himself, you know. And uh, now the only reason I'm sharing that is because when I came to this step, then, you know, when they said to me, you know, admit it to God, to yourself and to another human being, I... I uh, that had a big thing in me because my whole thing was trust. I had a big thing with trust, you know, and, you know, letting someone in. That was very hard for me to let somebody in, you know. Uh, but this was some of the challenges I found with it and, uh, and you know, the difficulty about it because I, I grew up with so many beliefs and through me drinking, and early days in sobriety, I had formed beliefs, attitudes, and ideas, not only about other people, but about myself. About myself, a lot of self-critical attitudes and ideas that I was a, a failure as a father, for instance. You know, I couldn't stop drinking for my daughter, so therefore there's something badly wrong with me. I, 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 I thought in my head, I started this belief that I, you know, that I didn't love her, I wouldn't you know, all that sort of stuff. So this is me coming into uh, starting to work through this stuff, being given a four step, you know. I've done it a few times with people. The first guy I've done, I've done a life story. I wrote out a life story. He read a couple of things out of it and he says, okay, you can burn it. Now, I never learned nothing out of that. That was my first experience with doing this. The second experience was we went to a Joe and Charlie tips and there was a guy done the sheet, the Joe and Charlie sheet, and we started going through it. And that did have a that did help me. You know, that was the start of starting to see what to look at here, you know. Um I went through it with another guy. He was similar to Joe and Charlie, but he just added it was more like a counseling angle he put on it then. But then going through it with Howard, we used the fifth five columns. And I thought that was really a lot better because, you know, we look at the cause. What's the cause? You know, we listed our angers. We listed our fears. We listed, um, you know, we looked at our sex conduct. People we'd harmed our sex conduct and looked at harms other than sexual. That's the four areas we look at, right? So we start with the cause. Who am I angry at? People, um, institutions and principles listed them. What is the cause? We look at the cause. Why am I angry? affects my look at what it affects then where had i or what did i do what did i do if anything to set this in motion but this is where i really uh, got the benefit out of it 
we're doing doing Joe and Charlie's one does give me wiggle room. There was a lot of things I didn't do, but I never really saw how the resentment or the anger or the fear was still impacting on me. And the way Howard done it, we list like two words, have and will. And the have, the each stand for a word, like the H stands for harbored. I harbored the anger. I held on to the anger, the resentment, the fear. I hang on, I hung on to it. I allowed the resentment. You know, the event has passed years before, but years later, I'm still playing this over in my head, hurting me. I'm doing it to me now, not the other person. Uh, and some instances, I felt victimized. I would play the victim. Some instances, you know, I had expectations that either this wouldn't happen to me or the outcome would be different. So I'm holding on to expectations. Then we have the word will. I built up walls over the head of this stuff. You know, the problem with building walls for me was I never I never built a gateway into the wall to let me out. That was the problem with walls that I experienced. Then was I irresponsible? Did I lay? And that means laying by a mission too. And that was a new angle for me when I did we heard the laying by a mission. And then lack prayer. There isn't a hope in hell that I'm praying for people. <laughs> Stone song to me. That does not come into my head. My head's about getting back at you. That's the way my head was geared, you know. And then, we, you know, we looked at, um, you know, did I character assassinate? Did I retaliate? Did I alienate? Did I use over the head of it? Did I drink and drug over the head of it? You know, this is my way of dealing with this stuff. You know, and then the last thing it says to the fifth column is where had I been? Now, this is where the the gold dust is, as it were. This is where the stuff I get for moving forward really is. So for me, a lot of times I had been frightened. And that in turn, I would act out. As a result of being frightened, I would act in various ways. You know, was I inconsiderate? Yeah, a lot of the time I was very inconsiderate. Was I irresponsible? Loads of situations I'm irresponsible. You know, I'm selfish. Absolutely. You know, I used to think selfish was, you know, I'll not give you some of my sweets. That's what I thought it used to be. It's not that at all. It's this constant thinking of me. How does this affect me? Is, am I going to get what I want? You know, this, this, this. It's all about me. It's like a friend of mine says, you know, I mightn't be much, but I am all I think about. <laughs> you know, I'm all I think about, you know. But... Uh, that, you know, the self-seeking, trying to advance on for me at someone else's expense. I don't that a lot, you know. I don't that a lot. And, uh, you know, judgmental. My God, I was riddled with judgmentalism. Judging everybody, you know, this and that. Making them worse, making me better. All this, the madness, like, you know. So this was it, you know, that, you know, when our fears then, it was, we didn't have as many columns. We only had three. You know, we looked at why I'm afraid, you know, and as Howard rightly says, wasn't it because self-reliance failed me, you know, so I'm afraid of, I listed what I'm afraid of and then why I have them, you know, and uh, we looked at rational fears and irrational fears, you know, these are just exercises we done and that, that was good, like, you know, and uh, then we looked at the, my sex conduct, we went back to the five columns. Now, a big thing for me with the sex conduct was I thought anyone I had ever been in a relationship where had sex with had to go on this list. And that wasn't the case. Because how we define who goes on our list is, was it selfish or not? Was it selfish or not? And, that's, and that was a whole different perspective for me. And I had to reflect a lot more on it and look at uh, my relations with uh, you know, people I was in relationships with. And that changed it for me because we're looking at, at what you see, I thought it was about the sex actor stuff like that. It wasn't nothing to do with that. It's about have I hurt people in areas? Uh, have I been selfish? Have I been dishonest? Have I been irresponsible with people in relationships? You know, um, this sort of thing. Wanting them to do things maybe they don't want to do 
or if they want to do something I don't want to do it, you know, that sort of thing. You know, been very selfish about it. If it doesn't suit me, I ain't doing it. These were the things that changed the whole perspective for me because what the big thing they say on this is to try and shape a scene in ideal sex life going forward. Now that's a whole different thing, you know. So that was a good help to me. And then the final one was anybody else we had harmed. And for me, that was like stealing from people. I owed people money. I'd done stuff, you know, other things that didn't cover, you know, the other three didn't cover. So they were the things I had to work on, right? Now, when we went to Howard with it, we started going through this and talking it out, you know. And the good that you see, but I see the benefit of step five and with why we do it with someone else's. Someone else will always see something differently from me, you know, because the, the way the book says, you know, we approach someone who will understand yet be unaffected. Like Howard was unaffected by these different people and events in my life, but he understood what I'm doing because he's done it himself. And therefore, he was able to see things because I was like um, emotionally and physically involved in these things, I don't see it so clearly because it's about me. Because like as Howard rightly said, I had a lifetime of rationalizing my behavior, denial, uh, justification for things I've done. You know, so these are the things that's working against me. That's why I need someone else there to go, well, no, no, hang on a minute. You know, you're letting yourself off the hook here. You know, I think you are being dishonest there. So it helps me to see the truth better. That's how I see this whole inventory process. So it's about me seeing the truth about me. And it takes, uh, the way it's designed, it takes away the, for me, the things that would stop me, the, my justification, my rationalization, my denial, it takes that away. And that's, that to me is the major difference between going to treatment centers and they get them to write life stories and AA's way of doing an inventory. Totally different. This helps me to see the truth. Writing a life story doesn't. I know my life story. That doesn't keep me sober, you know. Whereas this did, because this helps me to see the truth moving forward, you know. And as Howard rightly said, that fifth column stuff. I was amazed how dominated I was by it. It's like it's like wearing an old favorite coat. It's second nature to me, you know. So basically, in a nutshell, what I've seen about this is. Somebody or an institution or a principal say does something, right? This is how it affects me. And then this is how I react. To me, that's at the all in a nutshell. Something happens, somebody does something, this is how it affects me, this is how I react. I react out of this um, selfishness. I react out of being dishonest. I react out of being irresponsible, I react from being judgmental, I react because I'm frightened and as a turn as a result of that I step on the toes of my fellows they got hurt and they retaliated back and there the vicious cycle kept going round and round and round you know and that's why I was a prisoner to it and hence when they say about look at the causes and conditions of me drinking because I was, they would retaliate and do that, how do I deal with that? I take a drink because a drink changes how I think and it changes how I've been. That's why I don't know. And there the vicious thing went. So the, the whole emphasis then on the fifth column is this is what I'm going to take into the six and seven to change into assets. And that was a new novel thing for me because here where I'm from, there wasn't a lot talked about six and seven. And I don't think people here really understood what it meant. Whereas Howard give us out handouts. So this, instead of being um, so selfish all the time, try and be selfless. Instead of being dishonest, try and be honest. You know, turn the opposite into the opposite and practice the best I can. If I ask God to direct and, you know, help me to live into the assets or live up to the asset, then I have to put it into action. And how that changed for me with my family, especially my mother and father, was we, we have a wee thing called subtler harms. And how I would be around them, I mightn't say anything or do anything, but I would be moody. I would be sulky. I wouldn't be pleasant to be around. 
that to me, this really helped me to change and see that and change it to be more pleasant around them. Be, you know, that sort of way. That was a great help to me. So that's how I turned that into an asset, you know, and uh, move, it helped me to move forward as, as Howard says, I need this information for me six, seven, eight, and nine. That's why it's important, you know. But again, that was the difference between doing it with Howard and doing it with other people that I did it with. I had more to go forward with, you know. And um, I talk on this out with someone. Um, I suppose there was relief there, but I, I, I think what it did, it gave me motivation for going forward. It gave me hope. It gave me that that sort of belief, you know, that um, going forward somewhere, I can't put it right onto words, you know, but it was like, as I always share, it's like breathing out. When I first took alcohol, that's what it done for me. I didn't get a high of alcohol. I got the sense of everything's going to be all right and I can breathe out. And going through our program, that's kind of what's happened to me. I'm able to breathe out and go, okay, everything's going to be all right. But the good thing about this is this hasn't turned back on me and nearly cut me to ribbons. Our program hasn't done that, whereas alcohol did, you know. So that's some of my experiences with, you know, like I have to talk about four when I talk about five. That's just for me the way it is. But the five, we hired and talking it out, it helped me to see the truth better because he was able to point things out and not let me off the hook with certain things, you know. And that's the reason, you know, that's how, so I can, how is it? So I see the truth better moving forward, you know, because of the head I have. I have a head that's in denial at times, you know. So that's it for me, and that's uh, great to be here and to share this with you, and I hope somebody got something out of it. Thank you, Hart. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, John Forrest, do you want to pick up the mic? Thank you, Howard. My name is John Forrest, recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is the 11th of June 2013. By the grace of a God that I didn't want to believe in and the gifts of a 12 step program I didn't know was there. I've not needed or wanted a, a drink or any other moon of mind altering substances from that date because I'm not a specialist either. I am sponsored and I do sponsor. Uh, yes, so step five, that humbling step, you know. I, I, I've done it many times with many people and each time. I've got a different outcome out of it because it, I felt more humility. And what I, you know, I've, it's the, the the process I had to go through to 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 find the humility and you know that, that humbling feeling. You know, where I thought I find I can get to a point, and I still have to still do some more work. I have to go and find, as it says to other people, from my from my years I've, I've gone through. Found my first sponsor, Mike Wright, and I, yeah, he took me through the first step. It was very basic out of the 12 and 12. But, you know, it wasn't that I was doing it wrong. I just wasn't doing it right. And that got me to a certain point in my recovery. And Mike was a lovely man. And I, 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 we buried Mike at five years sober. I carried his coffin and, you know, what a beautiful experience. And what he did was, for me was he got me to a point. Then I, I, had, I, well, I was a seeker, me. From from listening to how people like Howard, like Bob Darrell, Chris Raymer, Miles Raymer, you know Scott Leeds, and they was all talking about the, this the way they put a step five, step four on the inventory and had a step five and had you know had this experience and it's something I never had, so I became the seeker of this experience, and I found for me that the experience that it doesn't stop after the first time you do it. Every time I do it, it's a different experience. And I get it, you know, the, treat, the doctors can't give me this experience. I, my, my a closed mouth friend can't really give me this experience because they don't know what they're looking for. There's many things, many traits that I'll have that only an al only al one alcoholic can help another alcoholic. And especially true in this step five, because we can point out where, where, we're, where we've gone wrong. I like the fact it was, I heard for many years around the rooms, it's a uh, look for your part in it, look for your part in it. If I'm looking for my part in it, it means somebody else is playing a part in it. And it was pointed out to me very early on in my recovery, look, John, it's, it doesn't say that, it's where are you to blame? Look at where, where, where you're to blame in this. Not the inventory's yours, not the other people's. 
and I'm glad it, I'm glad that was pointed out to me very early on where I, where was I to blame because now I can get on with doing my not my inventory so my first inventory is my all four inventories make up the resentment so my first thing is why is about angers I never realized how angry I actually was until I'd done the angers inventory each time and I can be eight years sober doing an angers inventory and still hold some of these angers towards people. These indigents that, you know, can get fly off the handle for no reason. But I have to get it down on paper again and again and again. Why am I being selfish, self-centered, dishonest? You know, for me, I, I, step five and step ten are, are closely linked because I've got to understand how to do an inventory in step four, how to verbalize it in step five to bring it to step ten. Because then I can do it on a daily basis. I, I'm not on the phone to Howard every two minutes. To Howard, I'm, I've been selfish, say self because I can get it down myself. I can understand how how to work this into my life. Because this is what the, the, the fifth step for me is, is a working step into my life and how I present it through my life on a daily basis. I'm, I, it says in 164, is that I, can't, I can't transmit something I haven't got. So if I've not done a fifth step, how can I tell, how can I go through a fifth step with somebody? It's impossible. So I can't sponsor somebody and say, oh, I, you know, take them through the call, column one, the cause, column two, abbreviate it. So again, I, I get a lot of people trying to, well, uh, me especially when I first trying to write my life story. And so it's 19 words in the book. It's all abbreviated. So I kind of help them break it down on that as well. I'm, you know, I'm angry at blah, blah, blah. And how does it affect me? Anything, it affects my, my pocketbook, my, you know, my, my sex relations. So, you know, it's, it's all about looking in, inwardly at me and looking, and then the, in the fourth call, to look, what, do you know, it's again, where am I to blame? Why am I harboring this resentment against these people? So many of these people have got on with their lives. They don't even know I've got still got a resentment. An anger against him, sorry, I do apologise, an anger against him. 20 years down the line, I'm still angry against this person sticking, bought the voodoo doll and sticking pins in it. But, you know, I have to understand that, you know, these are my conditions. I've been conditioned all my life to be this person. Called conditions of worth. And so they're interjected values to me where, you know, everybody tells me to be this person. So I'm whatever, whatever person you want me to be. So no wonder my self-esteem is low. No wonder my, my pride is what you think pride is. It's not what it, it is for me. No wonder my ego is built on what you think of me, like my self-esteem. So once I've realised all this and I can look at it and I've realised why, why I'm allowing all this stuff because column three is allowing me to take it over to column four, I can then think, okay, I, I understand why this is happening to me now. And do you know what all of this then got after the, the way I played a victim to me was the victim to me a lot of the time was I'm a nice guy, me. Why would this happen to me? After me stepping on the toes of my fellows first, robbing somebody, uh, beating somebody up, and then, then going, oh God, what, what, why, why would this happen to me? Why have I been arrested again? Why have I ended up on another three day bender again? I, I had the blame thrown out for everybody because I was the playing a victim. Because my expectations of people would, I, I used to have this crazy thing that I used to say, love, honour and obey. If I can't love you, I can't honour you. If you can't honour you, I can't obey you. I expected every, everybody to live by that code. Guess what? They didn't. They hurt me because I felt like they were letting me down or they was never there for me. And I, I give so much. And so, again, it's all about my expectations being the victim. And walls are me. When I, put, what I, when I talk about walls, I say boundaries. Because I didn't have any boundaries. So I was boundaryless, but I thought everybody knew what I, I should be doing. And, and, and you know, I was irresponsible with every relationship I ever had. Because it was uh, because I couldn't have a relationship with John, I couldn't have a relationship with anybody else. And it's a really sad fact that, that uh, my relationships were built on sand. So this process allowed me to get, uh, to get right with me. As Howard said before, you know, to start living in the three dimensions, to walk to the fourth dimension, so happy, joyous, and free me, that fourth dimension of living, the spiritual life, I'm okay with life. Not 99% of the time, I'm okay. You know, I'm not perfect. I do make mistakes. 
because I'm human. I'm not. I'm infinite, not finite. But the one for me, that, you know, I, then I see for the first time, because I, I get the Joe and Charlie stuff where we're doing the tip boxes and my sponsor was saying to me, I can see how selfish you've been there, how dishonest you are there. I had to do this work on myself for the first time. I had to pull these out for myself and then list them over and over and over and over and over and over again. So I got a common theme. And when I done the chicken scratches, I really got a common theme of how, where, where I was at with my life. And what I do then is I, I look at how column three, column five has affected column three. And I highlight them and join them together because then I can see that really where, why, why my self-esteem is actually, is, my, is actually out with my dishonesty. But it was my fears for me that really woke me up. Because my past life, I was, I was a bit of a, a character, should we say. A hoodlum, as Howard did call me the first time we started. He was a hoodlum, man. And, you know, I thought I could control everybody by violence and being angry and, you know, just shout, I always shouted the loudest. And, and I found out it was just another mask. And it, it was all to, to do with my fears. Fear, fear of people finding me out, losing some I've got. So you know, this, this person that I'd built up from being six years of age, I entered a boxing ring at six years of age. And I was still a six-year-old person at 40. 45 years of age and there's nothing I could do about it um, do you know when I I got to the phase and I prayed on my phase now and I started then being able to release the phase thinking that's how me together the phase I came in with nine years ago and not the phase I have today because every year I tend to pick up some different phase because I work on the phase from the previous years and I get new ones because when I first came in, I was just afraid of just walking down the street. I'm okay with that now. I'm sat in, in Manchester here in the Roman fort, but we had the Roman fort. I could never come round here. And so then it was looking at others again. So where have I harmed everybody in my life? Do you know? It was difficult for me this time because I put my sons really down in it because my eldest son is gay and, you know, all my life, I was I was basically a neo-Nazi at times. I was I was racist. I was homophobic. I was everything I shouldn't have been. I was none of that really. But if, you, if you, again, if you look at my angers and my how I've harmed others, they walk hand in hand with each other. I was everything people wanted me to be. A male, his son was gay, and you know, he wanted to tell me it was. I was thinking about two years sober when he told me, and I, I never realised how much I'd harmed him until I went through my inventory a couple of years ago with well, I've done my amends to him because I can't do the amends unless I do the fifth fourth or fifth step as well. And he kind of said to me, you know, I couldn't tell you because of the way you used to be. You know, everybody was this, everybody was that. It was everybody else's fault but John. But today I you know I, I took my, my eldest son to his first meeting two or three years ago. When he broke up with his boyfriend, he was I was the first person for it to ring, not his mum. When he's recently been, he went to be a, a, a cross-dresser, I suppose, what you, what you call him, a drag queen, and he became a porn star. He, you know, the whole of the family fell out of him, and it was me that pulled the family back together because because of what this stuff does to me. It opens my mind up to say, but who says I'm right? I'm not afraid of what people think of me anymore, or more to a point of what people think of Brooke anymore. It's his life. If he's okay with being okay with him, what's he got to do with me? Nothing. So the fear's melted away. It doesn't mean it doesn't come back some days. It comes back with abundance of my financial insecurity. It's crazy. The more money I earn, the more financial insecure I can become on days. And then other days I'm thinking, well, this is great. Your business is good. Everything's good. But I have to keep inventory in these fears. Keep looking at them. This is not a, a closed book, done and dusted, put it to one side, burn inventory time. Never burnt one inventory. I'm glad I never did that. Still got all my inventories. Because for me, they're a checkbook as well for what I do from year to year to see how much I've actually grown in that year. Sometimes it can be very little. So in the first few years, it was quite big, the, grow, the growth. Now it's, you know, it's, work. it's like when I go to the gym. I've got to work on it more than I did back then. And then, the, you know, 
my sex inventory this time. I've I've been pretty good in in, in uh, recovery with my sex. You know, I've, I've not had one affair. I've not had a, a, had a, a relationship with a woman up behind my wife's back, or don't even not even flirted with women behind my wife's back. Because you know what? She divorced me once. She let me back into her life. I'm going to divorce me again. There's no way I'm going to let it happen a third time. So I kind of took a I worked on this. So what I had to look at me was when when she divorced me. How selfish and self-centered I was with women then, and why she got rid of me. And it was a revelation, Joe, to think to find out again that it's all me. This is all where, where I'm. So it's all how how John gets out of John. John can fix John with anything, but the, what this has taught me is I don't need to fix. Once I'm right with me, I can be right with you. The world can be okay. But I can't get right with you until my sponsor or his sponsor or we've gone through an inventory with somebody. This is my experience. And once I've gone through that, I can then approach the world in my steps eight and nine with a different attitude. I do have the same safe, safe sex ideal now. Do you know, my life used to be all about get your rocks off. Now it's not about that. It's about how, how I can be at peace with the world. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, friends, it's been the most amazing meeting um, for a long, long time. Every meeting is uh, uh, a blessing, uh, but today has been very, very strong and powerful. Thank you so much, Howard, for leading this meeting. Uh, Howard, I would uh, like you to close off this meeting by summarizing, and then after that, if you can please uh, read the promises and uh, close the meeting with the serenity prayer. Over to you, sir. Sure. Um, as the guys were, 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 am I on? Yeah, okay. As the guys are explaining, you know, it, this is all a process. It's like building blocks. Um, mm. you know, when we recognize in the first step that uh, I can't fix me, that a sick mind cannot heal a sick mind, that I'm in need of a power that outside of myself, something non-human in nature that's going to fix me. And in the third step, I made a decision to pursue that power by implementing a plan of action that started with that fourth step inventory that the guys have been talking about, in which I looked at the things in me that are blocking me from that power. If I want you to park in my garage, I have to remove the clutter that's accumulated over the years before you can pull your car in. So if in the second step, I recognize that God is going to be the new center of my life, that it's no longer going to be what's in it for me. What, what do I get out of it? Me, 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 me. And I go to God centered. Well, I've got that's that's the stuff that's cluttering it up up here. If God can't get in if there's all of that junk there. So in the fourth step, I write those things down, the things that block me from my creator, my angers, my fears the sex conduct and the harms that have caused others that have caused me guilt and shame and remorse. And those are the things that have been ruling, controlling and dominating me. And it was in the fifth step that I recognized by looking at those things, how my resentments, how other people through my resentments towards them have been ruling, controlling and dominating my life. And if I'm going to go to a life that's dominated and ruled and controlled with God at the center. Well, as the book says, God either is or he isn't. What is our answer going to be? The answer to that question is the basis upon which I found every decision for the rest of my life. And that happened as a result of seeing that I was using these other defective mechanisms for control and rule. I was leaning on those things. And in the fifth step, I was able to see that. By going through my inventory, my sponsor could... Tell me, well, you know, it, you got down that you're inconsiderate here, but it's not inconsiderate. It's dishonest. He was able to see the things in me that I couldn't see for myself. I need somebody who's walked this path. Now, I notice I always make friends when I say stuff like this. But, you know, if I know a lot of people who have finished their fourth step. And they're into their fifth and sixth and they're sponsoring people. And I firmly believe what the book says, that you cannot transmit a message that you haven't got. You cannot take someone through the steps if you haven't been through the steps. That doesn't mean, well, I can take them up to where I am, the fourth or fifth step. 
Absolutely not, because we're going to use that information. The guys have talked about it. I've talked about it. The information that we gather in our fourth step and share in our fifth step, we're going to look at and be asked to be free of in the sixth. The sixth step, we look at it and say, I don't want to be that way anymore. God, take this away and make them into assets in the seventh step. So we build upon those things, but we come to face them in the fifth step. The fifth step, I recognize the defects and that those are the things that have been leading to my downfall. And that's what the fifth step is all about. It's not about coming clean with someone for the first time. Yeah, it is part of it. But if all of my sponsor does is sit there and nod at me, I'm not getting an effective fifth step out of him. Because this the fifth step is a two-person process. The person who's listening to it has to be a guide. And what I try and do is I am extracting information in the course of the fifth step that we're going to come back to in the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth. And if you haven't worked those steps, how are you going to know to extract that? How are you going to know to guide somebody there? So that's why I say that if you haven't been through the 12 steps, you can't take someone through the 12 steps. If you've only been through five, you can't take someone through four. It doesn't work that way. I know I've made, I've always alienated a number of people with that, but I firmly believe the book says you cannot transmit a message you haven't got. And the message is revealed in the first part of the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. That's the message. And I can't transmit that if I don't do it myself, if I haven't been there myself. I can't tell you what life is like in Paris, France. I've never been there. I can tell you what I've read about, but I can't tell you what it's like because I've never been there. So in order to sponsor someone, as far as I'm concerned, you need to have gone through the 12 steps. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.